The word monster is associated with beasts, dangerous living creatures, creepy hybrids, masses of something which nature is difficult to explain. But what if an entire place, a city itself, becomes an enormous monster? Jacques Rivet, a surrealist, a critic and a mentor, is my favorite filmmaker of French New Wave. When you look at many of his films, it's difficult not to notice a character of a place and its influence on other characters. Looking at the city as a monster, I will analyze Paris Belongs to Us, 1961, which is the director's first feature film, Out One, Na Limit and Guerre, 1971, which is a 13-hour movie taking place after the Raid May, Sven and Lily Go Boating, 1974, a surreal complicated wonderland, and The North Witch, 1981, which is, in my opinion, a compilation of Rivet's best ideas. Most of the references in this essay will be to The North Witch. In all of those films, characters are doomed to be in the same situation and context with no exit. Their future seems to be defined, and characters mention it constantly. The surveillance and conspiracy seems to be everywhere, though in many cases with little proof. To understand how the place, the Paris of Rouet, may be monstrous, let's follow seven principles of monster culture, formulated by Jeffrey Jerome Cohen in the book Monster Theory. We'll be also sometimes looking at the book of Stephen Esma on monsters and the natural history of our worst fears. 1. The monster body is a cultural body. The first words said in the North Bridge are There is a babel between two of us. Those are the words of a monster hunter, a girl Baptiste, who follows the other character, Marie, everywhere, trying to save her from an unknown conspiracy, which may or may not be true. The Babel itself is a large monstrous construct depicted in the Bible and mentioned by Rouvet in his references to the movie Metropolis in his debut Paris Belongs to Us. Babel was an ancient metropolis in which an enormous group of people tried to construct a Babel tower. According to the legend, it led to the punishment from the skies. The people became speaking different languages. Babel Tower was evil with no purpose of being evil as are many monsters which are mentioned by Esma in the beginning of his book. Talking about context, Cohen says in the first thesis, Monster is a metaphorical crossroads and is embodiment of a certain cultural moment of time, feeling and a place. It applies both to ancient Babel and to Paris of Rivet. Monster is highly dependent on historical context, on fears of an era, on aftermath of certain events, but who created the monster in all of those films? My answer is theater and conspiracy, most importantly in Paris Belongs to Us and in Out One. But the theater appears metaphorically in Celine and Julie and in The North Bridge too. Actors are constructing their play, their story, the same way the conspiracy constructs a monster. Those two groups, of actors and of conspirators, always merge at some point making a distinct parallel. In the North Bridge, conspiracy finds its embodiment in a game of the goose, and this game is almost an anatomy of the monster, depicting his actions and functions. In a film, this game is drawn on Paris itself, and real places of the city become parts of the constructed body. Character of Marie, an adult woman released from prison, says that the game of the goose is a scary game. Of course it is, but at least that is what helps characters to explore the monster and his monstrosity. There are many fields in this game, for example, there is Labyrinth. It's a physical place in which characters find a part of the conspiracy, as in the legendary Labyrinth Theseus finds Minotaur. Returning to the thesis about cultural body. Esma may have agreed with Cohen, adding that monsters are mistakes that occur when normal reproductive process fails. In Out One, we see Paris in a state after a student revolt of 1968 failed. Rivet, as many other French directors of the time, had seen those revolts as the beginning of a new age, a reproduction of Paris at least. It all failed, and at the time a film is taking place, we have monstrous Paris with small groups of an East people wandering around the city as opposed to crowds of 1968. In Paris Blonds to Us, we see a context quite like this, at the end of 50s and crisis in France. 
The new wave still didn't appear, political changes didn't come at the moment of film being made, and at this moment of reproduction failure we have a monster. In the North Bridge we see an apathy of late 70s beginning of 80s, but with the character of Batiste there is a depiction of feeling that something new is about to be born, and something old, the character of Marie just doomed to die, being eaten by a monster. Paris and his monstrosity evolves during all Rouvet's filmography, adapting to contexts and always ready to annihilate its next victims. And that's where we come to the second point of J.J. Cohen. 2. The monster always escapes. As we see, the monster is reborn in all of epochs, end of 50s, end of 60s, end of 70s, and that's exactly what Cohen mentions in his second point. Characters may think they are finished with the monster, but this giant mess will, slightly adapted, return in the next film. Monster has his agents, who are his hands, eyes or ears. Their job is to make sure the monster will live. In case of the North Bridge, those agents are evil maxis, as Batiste calls them, a collective body which is directly involved with the conspiracy. Batiste knows that it's no use trying to kill the agent because, like with Hydra, the hand, which is the max, will be replaced with another hand. She, as a true monster hunter, tries to get to the core of the monster and to finish him there. One of the most exact comparisons to the max from the North Bridge are Agents of Matrix, created by Wachowskis. These agents are exactly the same as Maxis, they are everywhere, they are helpers of the system, but nevertheless quite independent creatures who can make their own choices. 3. The monster is a harbinger of a category crisis. According to Cohen, it's not easy to categorize the monster. Asma also talks about them as in-between beings. For example, between creature A and creature B, a hybrid, or between being dead and being alive, between being small and being giant. Various of Rivet is, in this case, in between adequate life and conspiracy. Also, how does the Paris of Rivet look like? Of course, it's not mass culture Paris of tourist attractions, it's not a romantic city and not a city of art. It's the usual Paris, and there are outskirts, demolished buildings, modernist panel housing, empty space, unknown bridges and many, many stairs, yards and fences. The place may be empty, but more often it's claustrophobic as hell, and some of the characters even have a real claustrophobia, Marie from the North Bridge being an obvious example. Paris of Rivet may be, in a way, usual Paris, but there is something frighteningly unusual in it. Also, there are locations which seem to be gateways from the monster, like du Hazard in Out 1, but in some ways they are the monster. This Paris may also be a Paris of stages, open air theaters and rooftops, all highly performative and theatrical. Of these all things Rouvet's Paris is connected with, staying between conspiracy and absolute realism, it may be said that it's technically in the Uncanny Valley. Uncanny Valley is a theory which talks about a proportion of realist and realist and emotional response from us. For example, a human doll may be creepy to us because it looks human, but not enough human. The same way, Paris here is just like Paris, but not enough Paris, especially in the North Bridge and in Celine's legal boating. 4. The monster dwells at the gates of difference. People may name monster a person which motives are difficult to understand and which actions seem inhuman. That's where dehumanization comes into place. Monster may easily be a scapegoat for us, the same way conspiracy and Paris as a whole seem to be to many of Rivet's characters. Monster can be not only a scapegoat, but also a source of heroism for people who deal with him. It's shown in letters to Aristotle, which Asma mentions in his book. Those letters are written by Alexander the Great, whose army, according to the letter, struggled with an army of animalistic monsters on their journey. Reading this, you can think of an army as other than heroic. Earlier I've mentioned that Batiste from the North Bridge is Monster Hunter. Indeed, she tries to fight the monster and protect people from him. She has a helmet and talks about her armor, but as other monster fighter, Kaufman from Paris belongs to us, her words just make her sound really weird. In his book, Asma makes an example of Beowulf as a monster hunter and talks about the fact that Beowulf becomes a kind of monster himself, 
more human than perhaps the Grendel who needed to be hugged, as Asma says. The same thing happens in Paris Belongs to Us with Kaufman and with Batiste in The North Bridge. The end lives of people who, being or being not part of the conspiracy, are just people. Their death can change the giant monster, but indeed turns monster hunters into monsters themselves. There is another way to be monster in Jacques Rivet's films. It's theater. Out one starts with an hour and a half scene of improvised repetition, in which a theatrical group merges into one not understandable monstrous mess. Some of actors become monster hunters, some of actors turn out to be agents of the monster, but in the scenes of repetition they are much like the monstrous spirit itself. A mess of bodies, techniques, sounds, beliefs, appearances, pretty much a monstrous construct. And that's the time to talk about Plato's monster, as mentioned in Asma's book. There are three parts of the monster psyche, and they are unbalanced. Reasoning power, emotional conviction, and appetite or desire. Reasoning power is described as a human, emotional conviction as a lion, and appetite as a giant mass of hands, eyes, and teeth. In a monster, these imbalanced natures grow into one hybridic being. We can easily see how reasoning power is the conspiracy, emotional conviction is theater, and the mess is the body of the city. Combined, they merge into one chaotic monster which neither conspiracy, theater, or a city structure can take a full control of. Although this is prominent in all films this essay is about, in the North Bridge we see many lions themselves. Batiste rides around them in different parts of the city. Lions, lions and lions, kind of a minimalistic monster itself, a symbol of both emotion and power, a clear allusion to Battleship Potemkin's lions. In Battleship Potemkin, lions were also a part of hybrid, at that time not a city, but a whole empire. There were a cross, a knife and a lion, who were in control of the empire and with whom the sailors were struggling with. The same platonic monster only 50 years earlier. Let's return to the letter to Aristotle, where the army of Alexander was fighting with animalistic monsters. An important factor is where this battle took place, on the way to India, to an unknown land. Therefore, it's time to introduce the fifth thesis of J. J. Cohen. 5. The monster polices the border of possible. It's well seen in legends of many civilizations. Let's mention giants of Patagonia as an example. Monstrous beings guard the unknown and prevent us from knowing it. They can literally be gatekeepers. In Rivet's films, the monster hides the unknown in its structure and prevents characters from knowing it. That's why Batiste and Marie play the game in the North Bridge. That's why Colin from Outrun tries to go through difficult algorithms to know more about the conspiracy. They all are, if not fighting with the monster, arguing with him. In the end, as those characters come to a location which is crucial to the monster. It's linked with him, but it's not necessarily a part of him. In Selena and Julie go boating, it's a mysterious house which characters find quite early in the movie. Time in this house seems to be in a loop, hiding the conspiracy inside it. In Out One, it's a house in Abad, which is, geographically speaking, not inside Paris, but feels to be surrounded by it. In Paris belongs to us, it's a flat of the theatre director, Gerard, who is doomed to be a victim. In The North Bridge, it's the metal human constructed form in the final of a movie. So, each film has something over the border, something for monster to guard. 6. A fear of monster is really a kind of desire. That proportion of fear and desire is why people like horror, that's why people like gruesome mysteries. We know that what we find is dangerous, but not for us. In Red's films, Many characters have the same logic. Be it Colin from Out One or Marie from the North Bridge, they play with the monster and see it as not as dangerous as other figures try to convince them. But in the world of Jacques Rivette, it's a mistake. Characters are attracted to mystery, but they fear it in some way, not much though. And that works on a micro level too between characters themselves. In Paris Belongs to Us, Gerard and Annette seem to have an attraction-repulse game. The same way Batiste tries not to contact Marie at first, 
but then is tied to her for the whole duration of the film. In Out 1, these relations of characters are even in the title, Na Limit and Gre, which takes us back to the biblical story. And, of course, all characters are both attracted and repulsed by a monster, Paris itself. Asma in his book writes about almost the same attraction and repulse, and in films we see it even how characters are interacting with parts of a conspiracy, with the game of the goose being an example. The last thesis J.J. Cohen mentions is 7. The monster stands on a threshold of becoming. Monsters ask to reevaluate cultural assumptions. Returning, they say something of an age they were in previously. They speak about the context and the situation in the world, as does through its spirit. In between, always evolving, chaotic and complicated. It says something about every epoch his films are taking place. It's both documentary and grotesque, but grotesque is built on a situational context. Rivet takes much from surrealism, expressionism and film noir, but creating a whole new world in his films. Creating a human, a lion and a mess, and putting them into complete unbalance. Rivet is himself a creator of the monster and, in a way, an antagonist to his own characters. Let's return to the point close to the end of the North Bridge when Baptiste and Marie stand on that North Bridge and Baptiste finds her final boss. This final boss is a children's bunny hill, but Baptiste knows that it's a dragon who breathes with fire. She deals with him, but it turns out on the other side of the bridge is still Paris, and hunting of evil Maxis is not over. The game continues even after the dragon, because the monster itself the city can't really die, and it's even a good question whether he can be balanced or tamed.